Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. A very warm welcome to all of you on this, the third Sunday of Easter. Welcome as well to those who are worshiping with us online. And I was uh, tied up uh, with my sermon last night and didn't receive the news about uh, Iran's attack on Israel until this morning. And so, of course, we gathered here as we have for the last six months with our hearts heavy um, for what is happening in the Holy Land. And today we join our prayers with people around the world for the security of Israel, for peace finally in Gaza, and for healing in the Holy Land. We hear in our gospel reading of Christ coming to his followers in the devastation of the crucifixion and saying, peace be with you. And we hear, too, of Christ's forgiveness in the gospel passage. And so right at the outset of our worship, we acknowledge the sin and suffering in the world, and we also um, acknowledge our own failures to be as kind, to be as loving as we might. So trusting in God's mercy, understanding that God accepts each of us just as we are, let us confess our sin, initially in silence. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins. Bring us to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as it happens this morning, we have two songs new to us. Actually, that opening hymn was rather more new to me than I expected. I thought I was providing a vibrant opening hymn for all of us. And it is a lovely hymn, lovely words, and it's a lovely tune. I just didn't know it. And I suspect as I came through the congregation, a few of you didn't either. You are unlikely to know these next two songs. First one comes from Israel, a song of praise. Uh, we use in place of the Gloria. And then to herald the gospel, we have uh, Alleluia from Palestine. So we will follow the lead of the choir. Do we come in at all here, Will? Or? Okay, we'll sing it twice. So if you catch it, sing it the second time through along with the choir.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Today's reading is from 1 John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away the sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. Be to God. Psalm 4. Answer me when I call, O God, defender of my cause. You set me free when I am hard pressed. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. Know that the Lord does wonders for the faithful. When I call upon the Lord, he will hear me. Offer the appointed sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. You have put gladness in my heart, more than when grain and wine and oil increase. Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus stood among his disciples and said to them, 
peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy, they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. That is what is underlying all the biblical accounts of the resurrection the conviction that Jesus is alive. Something extraordinary and unprecedented happened. The disciples discovered that the Jesus whom they knew to be thoroughly dead and buried was alive again. The crucifixion had been a shock that seemed to put an end to their faith in Jesus. But God the Father raised the Galilean prophet from the dead so that the disciples encountered once more the living Jesus. We can imagine that they were traumatized by his death, yet nevertheless, they experience his presence as a personal power and agency which is still active in their lives and still active in the world. For the first devastated followers of Jesus, his ghastly crucifixion was seared into their psyches. And yet, Easter hope emerges from this very place of shock and grief. The death of Jesus on the cross was horrific, pure and simple. But the Jewish interpretive tradition specializes in disaster and disappointment. We'll hear more about that this afternoon, I'm sure, from Jared as he discusses rabbinic Judaism, the incredibly creative response of mainstream Judaism to the events of the first century. In some ways, every bit as creative as the Jewish Christian response, which we find in the New Testament. But the Jewish interpretive tradition, yes, has dealt with disappointment after disappointment and devastation after devastation. And so these followers of Jesus, all of them Jews themselves, as they reflect on his last days, his courage, his silence, his sense of purpose, they come to see the continuity between the way Jesus lived and how he died. They begin to understand that rather than the expected messianic lion, Jesus 
came as the lamb, Isaiah's suffering silent victim, who became the sacrifice. On the cross, human agony is actually joined with divine glory. Rather than undoing the meaning of Jesus' life, the crucifixion brought his mission to an unlikely climax and consummation. And when the pieces of this interpretive puzzle fall into place, there can be a stunning clarity. Far from an ignominious defeat, the death of Jesus is a wonderful victory. Resurrection involves this recognition. Resurrection, it can even be said, is the crucifixion seen with the eyes of faith. In the Gospels, the appearances of the risen Jesus are all to believers. And St. Paul makes clear in his letters, especially the letter to the Romans, that whatever else they might be, crucifixion and resurrection are also spiritual realities. Their message is the same. Life is stronger than death. Love is greater than hate. Mercy overcomes judgment. And all the trials and tribulations of this life are transient. Yes, real and immediate and painful often, but they do not have the last word, and they do not represent the final reality. Over and over again, Paul refers to the resurrection in the present tense, because it is a reality that we, the followers of Jesus, are meant to live out. Now, to be sure, And let me be very clear about this. The most straightforward way of understanding the biblical accounts of the resurrection is that Jesus was bodily raised from the dead. Such an awesome miracle would explain how his followers, devastated by shock and grief, were transformed into a courageous band of brothers and sisters who set about spreading the good news far and wide that Jesus of Nazareth lives on as Messiah and Savior. However, I want to suggest, because I know from speaking with many of you personally, that some of you struggle with the bodily resurrection of Jesus. And even if you're completely happy with it, it may be that your children are not. This can be a stumbling block for many people developing the faith and trust in Jesus. And so I want to say this morning that a literal reading is not the only way of understanding the scriptural accounts of the resurrection. The Bible never presents the resurrection as an objective, provable event. It's completely uninterested in the mechanics of what actually happened. The resurrection can be understood not as a proof that is so clear that it actually negates the need for faith, but rather as the fruit of faith. Resurrection can happen when we ponder the scriptures and understand the suffering and death of Jesus as the triumph of love. So what I'm saying, in other words, is perhaps... It was not the events spoken of in the stories which convinced people that Jesus was alive. Maybe it was the other way around. It was Jesus' conviction. It was rather his followers' conviction that Jesus is alive, that they were experiencing him in their hearts, in their worship, in their continued reading of the Jewish scriptures, perhaps in the Eucharist, They knew that Jesus is alive. And it was this conviction that Jesus is alive, that he was raised from the dead, that gave rise to the stories. What came first was the message. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. And perhaps the narratives came afterwards. 
At the start of today's gospel passage from Luke, the disciples are startled and terrified. And acknowledging their fear, the first words of Jesus are, peace be with you. Fear turns into joy, but the disciples, we're told, are still disbelieving and still wondering. What transforms them into witnesses of the risen Christ is their minds being opened to the scriptures. Is their dawning realization that the Messiah was always meant to suffer and to forgive. And their realization that God has transformed a tragedy into a stunning victory, and that death is not the final word. It could be that when his followers grasped the fact that Jesus was not abandoned by God on the cross, that they saw the risen Christ. On this understanding, the resurrection accounts in the Bible exteriorize and objectify a spiritual reality. What perhaps came first was the faith experience. Jesus is risen, and the subsequent stories express in concrete and pictorial form a mystery that would otherwise remain almost inexpressible. To see the risen Christ could be more like seeing the conclusion of an argument than to seeing an apparition of Jesus. What came first could have been the experience of meeting the risen Christ, and the descriptions followed. And that possibility gains a little bit more credence when we put the stories in the chrono chronological order in which they were composed. The earliest accounts of the resurrection are the simplest with the fewest details. The stories become more concrete and more detailed as time goes on. Our first written accounts of the Easter event are not in the Gospels at all, they're in Paul's writings. And Paul never mentions an empty tomb. He is simply happy to pass on what is passed on to him, that Jesus appeared to his followers and laterally even appeared to Paul himself. Mark, the earliest of the gospel writers, as we discovered on Easter Sunday, Mark is able to convey the reality of the resurrection with no appearances at all. Matthew, written later than Mark, has the risen Christ delivering a discourse to his disciples. And in today's passage from Luke, written at roughly the same time as Matthew, Jesus invites his followers to touch him and then eats a piece of boiled fish in their presence. In that wonderful story of, in Luke's gospel as well, about the journey to Emmaus, right? Jesus is similarly recognized in the breaking of the bread. And when he opens their minds to the scriptures and their hearts are warmed, something hasn't happened to Jesus. He hasn't somehow taken off a mask and they recognize him. The change is within the disciples. The change is in with, with the disciples and they suddenly realize this is Jesus present with us. John's gospel, written last of all, in the resurrection narratives, Jesus makes a fire and cooks a breakfast on the beach for his followers. I love that story. The attempt to narrate, to put words to, to express the Easter reality results in an increased sense of the physicality of the risen Jesus, who now walks, talks, eats, and drinks with his followers. It seems that the stories grow in the telling. And the New Testament authors do not seem in the least bit bothered that their accounts of the resurrection are different and sometimes even contradictory. When you set them, and this is what scholars have to do when we train for the ministry, we set the resurrection accounts next to each other and we compare them. And what we discover is that they're very unclear, not just about who saw Jesus and when, 
but about where the appearances took place. Matthew saying that they're going to be in Galilee along with Mark and Luke being very clear, no, 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 the appearances need to to happen, have to happen, as we heard in today's gospel in Jerusalem. What this suggests is that the compilers of the New Testament, those who brought these four gospels together, and maybe even the writers themselves, never expected their resurrection stories to be taken quite so literally as most people understand them today. The resurrection narratives are true because they express the truth that Christ is alive, that his love is not extinguished on the cross, but that 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 love, the love of Christ, the love of God for each of us proves stronger than the forces that killed Jesus. Easter celebrates the power of Jesus to give new life to his followers who are in turn, as we heard today, empowered to transform the world. Jesus appears to his disciples for a reason, and he says it very explicitly in today's gospel. You, that's us, are to be witnesses of these things. That God's love is more powerful even than death itself. And so the resurrection of Jesus leads us to our own. He who proved himself alive at Easter also proves himself alive in us. And so our faith is not primarily in the miracle of a resurrection event, but in Jesus himself. That's always the case. Our faith is in Jesus himself. Trust in Jesus is what keeps us going through trials, sickness, and even death. And when we, as we are bidden in all of the resurrection narratives, when we offer ourselves in service to God, we too can experience the presence and the power of Jesus in an ardent union that even death cannot undo. Perhaps the historical details about what happened at Easter are not the crucial thing. It's in the trusting in Jesus. It's in the following of Jesus. It's in the struggle to be witnesses and to transform the world. We'll pray it later. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's in that trusting, it's in that following, it's in that struggle to make the world a better place that we gain the assurance that Christ is risen. We understand that the resurrection is real, is real for Jesus and is real for each of us. Amen. Uh, Please remain seated if you're more comfortable doing so, but I invite those who are able to stand for our Eastertide acclamation that comes from the Canadian Book of Alternative Services and from 1 Peter. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God has claimed us as his own. He has brought us out of darkness. He has made us light to the world. Alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. And you'll see the response to the prayers. Our response is hear our prayer. Holy Father, make us aware that the crucified one is alive and comes to us. Turn our doubts and disbelief into awe and wonder. 
as your beloved children, help us to know that we are forgiven and renewed. Make us apostles sent out to witness to your love. Bless the Anglican Church in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and Polynesia. Strengthen Bishop Rob, St. Stephen's Church in Pittsfield, and this congregation. Holy God, hear our prayer. Grant that the peace of Christ may break into a world where the innocent suffer and authority is often unjust, where there is strife between nations, hostility between races, and disputes between individuals, may Christ's peace bring a new and fuller life. Bless our servicemen and women, bring peace to Gaza and healing to the Holy Land. Holy God, hear our prayer. May the spirit of love dwell among our families, friends, and neighbors. Give strength to those who have been deprived of love. Make us attentive to the presence of Christ among us. In our towns and in all that we do, make us witnesses of the grace we have received. Holy God, hear our prayer. Comfort the lonely, the homeless, and the bereaved. Heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, especially those whom we name before you now, in silence or aloud. Holy God, hear our prayer. Raise up all those who have died, especially Lenny Gillespie and Susie Sanders. We remember with thanksgiving Susan Matthews, Eric Mom, Ann Thompson, Susan Mayer, Priscilla Roberts, Emily Bristol, Bruce Carlson, and Bob Foster. Grant us with them a share in your eternal glory. Holy God, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Risen Christ, you filled your disciples with boldness and fresh hope. <clears throat> Strengthen us to proclaim your risen life in word and deed and fill us with your peace. To the glory of God the Father, The risen Christ came and stood among his disciples and said, Peace be with you. The peace of the risen Lord be also with you. And also with you. Let us offer one another a sign of Christ's peace. Good morning. My name is Claire, and it's nice to be with you. It's wonderful to be with you here today. Uh, a few announcements. Uh, first of all, we want to thank Karen for the beautiful flowers that are adorn our sanctuaries today. Uh, they're given in continued gratitude and love for St. Andrew's congregation. So it's a testimony to all of you. So it's a wonderful gift. Uh, Jay mentioned that uh, Jerry Goldfarb will be with us again this afternoon at 4 o'clock. I encourage you to attend. He will be speaking on rabbinic Judaism from Romans to rab rebels to rabbi. Knowing Jared, 
somewhat. I'm sure that it will be a great presentation. He is certainly uh, a great scholar of, of um, biblical history. Uh, just a quick reminder for all ladies, there will be a breakfast next Saturday, and it's certainly a great time for fellowship. And uh, We have now joined the men's group who had had a, more, a breakfast on Saturdays uh, for some years, but now a new tradition has been started, and that's wonderful. And again, Composing a Life will be meeting this week. And if you look at your little purple flyers, there's lots of detail regarding that. And I encourage you to get in touch with Allison if you're interested. Haiti uh, is the focus of our outreach this month. Um, as most of you know probably from the news, um, this country has been devastated by gang violence. But there is always rays of hope and light, even in dark areas of the world. And um, St. Vincent's Center in Haiti is one of those centers of light. Every day they provide meals for over 300 children and they bring joy and an opportunity for healing for all of these families. Encourage you to give um, to this worthy cause. I also have a letter from the outreach committee that I want to share with you. Um, gotta get my glasses on so I can see. <laughs> um, this was a letter uh, that was received uh, from the Holy Land because we have supported in the past um, the Anglican Church in the Holy Land. So I'll read the letter. Easter greetings from St. George Cathedral in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. On behalf of Holly Hospital and the entire Diocese of Jerusalem, I would like to express my deepest thanks for your recent and generous gift of $12,022 to Holly Hospital to deal with the emergency resulting from the current war. Although it's been six months since the start of the war, by a miracle of God, Holly Hospital has never closed. It remains the only functioning hospital. The staff continue treating victims, many of them laid out upon the pews of St. Philip's Chapel. Under great hardships with bomb bombardments constantly around them, the staff at Holly Hospital and volunteers have worked night and day to bring God's healing love to the sick and the wounded brought to them. In this day, they have demonstrated our determination in the Diocese of Jerusalem to persevere in our Christian mission to serve others as though we were serving Christ himself. Your donation will not only help the mission continue at Holly as the war rages on, but after the war, it is over, it will also help heal and repair um, the hospital. In the meantime, the medicines and other vital supplies that we can now purchase will go a long way in helping to save the lives of the wounded civilians who are being brought to the hospital every day. Again, thank you for your gener generosity. May God bless you. Please continue to pray for us here, and please continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem and for security for all who dwell within the lands in Christ. The most reverend Hosam Naum. Um, you're, I think we are a unique church in our generosity every month. I thank you all for that. But this, these are words from uh, someone who's benefited directly from, from the generosity. Last announcement, because we need to keep moving. Uh, uh, Dr. Kathleen Rosenack will be beginning her classes on the chosen. As you were probably, as you were told um, some time ago, there were some legal issues with the producers of the chosen. So the, unfortunately, season four is not yet available for streaming. However, we were able to get uh, four episodes of season four sent to us digitally. We will be able to uh, view the, 
these episodes here at church, and that is the only place where it can be done. We cannot send the, these episodes to your home. So if you look at your insert, there are dates and times for the showing, and the, the Sunday following uh, the showing of the episode, uh, there will be a class after the service uh, to discuss the episode that was shown. Thank you for your love and for this community of caring here in a world that sometimes is dark. Oh, thank you, Claire. And yes, just to uh, mention that right after our service today, of course, we've got tea and coffee. And then the first, uh, the second of our pilgrimage group, walking St. Cuthbert's Way from Melrose, Scotland to Lindisfarne and finishing up at Durham Cathedral. They're meeting at 2 o'clock, so we won't set up the chairs for Jared's talk at 4 just yet. They'll be meeting at 2 o'clock in the parish hall. Speaking of pilgrimages, Luna, our live streamer, will be off to Ireland this year where she's got a special program she's devised around kind of reconciliation something like that she'll tell us more when we get back I've only heard indirectly from her teachers and I know something of Luna's trip so great good luck um, have a great time and we'll be thinking of you and uh, that leaves Sally to try and live stream the service from her phone next week just a warning to those who are watching online it will be slightly slightly different. Jeff Cleveland is also setting off. He's organizing the first group of our walkers, and he's actually headed to Spain to finish the Camino um, this week. And so do keep Jeff in your thoughts and prayers as well. The Chosen, yes, we've embraced it as a church. The first three seasons are all available online for free. Do watch them. And as Claire said, it's all the details about how to watch season four and then to join in the discussion is in the bulletin. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice of God. And the choir sings an anthem, a well-known hymn, but to a tune composed by our own William Ogmanson.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who is sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, we sing the mystery of faith. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrifice for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. The holy gifts of God for the holy people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving.
almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And I meant to mention just before we sing hymn number 182 that Hugo Anderson is home. I'm not sure about his medical condition, but I know that just being home has been very healing for him and for Marianne both. Do keep him in your thoughts and in your prayers. And I should have mentioned last week, Tom Vaughn is over from England. He gave a talk about his little and deeply spiritual book, Hope and the Hedgehog. Are you doing any more of those, or have we missed no, completely? No. <laughs> All right. Well, look out for it in the bookstore. Tom Vaughn, Hope and the Hedgehog. He's back to England this week. 182, Christ is Alive. <laughs> And we had a wonderful service yesterday to celebrate the life of David McMillan. Do keep Mary and all the family in your thoughts and prayers. But the choir sang this glorious benediction. And Will and I thought we will have more of that this morning. Our blessing is sung.
the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Alleluia, alleluia. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Alleluia, alleluia. alleluia.